Uh, welcome to Accessibility 201, Tales from the Front End. I'm going to start off with a question that's uh, rhetorical for now, which is, how do you create an accessible interface? And after you've created it, how do you know that you've actually succeeded in making it accessible? So I'm Caroline Boyden. I'm a web developer. I've been doing Drupal since 2009 accessibility since 2004, and web development of one kind or another since 1996. I work here at UC Berkeley, and I work on the web platform services team. Uh, one thing we do is we develop a Drupal distribution and provide it as a subscription service for any campus unit that uh, needs a website. And um, web platform services is also where the campus web accessibility <laughs> team is. We call ourselves Web Access. And before I get any further, I just have to give you a little disclaimer here, which is that I have opinions, and you're going to be hearing a lot of my opinions today, and the University of California would like me to inform you that these are my opinions, not necessarily <laughs> theirs, and also that nothing I say here should be taken as an endorsement of any product, service, or company. So uh, with that all out of the way, um, as part of the web access team, we see a lot. We've been giving accessibility clinics on campus since 2005. And so what a clinic is, is that a site owner or an application owner can bring their stuff to us. We sit down with them, their developer, maybe a third party vendor, and we walk through the application using assistive technology, etc., doing the tasks that they've identified as the most important for their visitors to be able to do. So we evaluate the accessibility of their stuff in that context. And we've seen uh, completely static sites. We see CMS sites like Drupal and WordPress. We also see native applications, web applications, things built with whatever the latest JavaScript framework is. And we've seen a lot of really great stuff, a lot of really innovative interfaces. But we also tend to see the same problems over and over and over again. So. Uh, in today's session, I'm going to be talking about how to avoid those problems. Mostly, I'm going to be talking about interactions and interfaces as opposed to content. And I'm going to come at this from three directions. First, a sort of a philosophical take on the question. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about specific technical pitfalls that you can avoid, uh, details about markup and code. And then at the end, I'm going to go over testing. So there is a ton of stuff to cover. And I don't want you to feel like you have to take notes or write everything down. So at the end of Bad Camp, I'm going to be posting these slides, uh, including my speaker notes on the session page, and also a bunch of other resources. And I would also like to hold questions until the end, so that I can, I can get through what I'm going to say, and then hopefully we'll have some time for discussion. So there are a lot of things that I'm not going to talk about today that are all really important for accessibility but I'm just not going to discuss them. And that's things like alt text, form field labels, link text, a lot of the stuff that's covered in the web content accessibility guidelines. So I'm calling that Accessibility 101. And I know that some of you went to the Accessibility 101 training uh, yesterday, and there's not going to be a lot of overlap. So hopefully we'll just be moving forward from there. Um, so if that's Accessibility 101, then uh, what's Accessibility 201? And to me, it's basically that question. Given everything that you might know about Accessibility 101, how do you actually use that information to create an accessible interface? And how do you make sure that it is actually accessible? So I'm going to start with a phil philosophical take here. Um, and the philosophical answer to the question, how do you make an accessible interface, is don't fixate on one type of disability or on one assistive technology. Because accessibility is much, much bigger than any one disability or any one technology. And oftentimes in a clinic or in other situations, a developer will ask us, you know, should I learn a screen reader to test my code? Or even, which screen reader should I learn to test my code? And we haven't answered that question. Uh, the short answer is no. <laughs> now the long answer is also no. Um, and you know, as a developer, I understand the impulse behind the question. I like to geek out over new tools, right? 
and screen readers are cool and powerful and interesting and complicated, but for a lot of different reasons, we tell designers and developers, no, it's not a good use of your time to learn how to use a screen reader. Uh, so why is that? First, not all people with disabilities are blind. Now that might be obvious, right? Uh, what's not so obvious is that not all screen reader users are blind. Uh, more about that later. But there are a lot of different types of disability that affect how people interact with interfaces. So I'm going to quickly go through some examples of different types of disability. Some of them you might be familiar with, others maybe not so much. So repetitive stress injury. This is very common. It's chronic injuries to wrists or hands that might interfere with your use of a mouse or um, make it hard to type. Other mobility issues, let's say you have limited dexterity and you can't hit a small mouse target or you can't type on a regular keyboard. Uh, low vision, plenty of people have some vision, but it can't be fully corrected. So they have low vision and need some accommodations for that. Uh, presbyopia, so this is the thing where you take off your glasses and you hold the book at like, you try to find the right distance so it's close enough that you can read the words but far enough away that you can actually focus on it. Presbyopia is the inability to focus at close distances, for example, reading, phone, or computer, and it's highly correlated with age, so it's something that a lot of people are going to experience. Color deficiency, up to 10% of men have some form of color deficient vision. Information processing, now this one is huge because it refers to anything that affects how you might take in or process information. So it could be autism spectrum, uh, attention deficit, cognitive or learning or developmental differences, mental health conditions like depression and anxiety, or fatigue, or something related to mood or emotion. All of these are things that affect your ability to process information and the ways that you process information. Um, people could be deaf or hard of hearing. Uh, some people are susceptible to seizures. Some people have motion-induced issues. So you think of car sickness. Well, these can also be caused by the perception of motion, not just physical motion. So if you're following relatively recent design trends and you see those full-width background videos, you know, they play automatically, or maybe it's a static image, but the effect is to sort of zoom and pan across it. Well, if any one of your visitors has vertigo, you gotta be careful because you, your website might be giving them nausea, and that's probably not the impression you want them to take away from it. So watch out for that. Uh, and there are a lot of things that are temporary or situational or things that we don't think of as disabilities, but they do affect how you interact with the interface. So, uh, language learners, people who don't natively speak the language that your application is written in, that's big. Chronic sleep deprivation, if you're a student at the end of the semester, or you're a parent, a new parent, and you have an infant at home, chronic sleep deprivation affects memory and information processing. Um, let's say you break your arm and it's your dominant hand and you can't use the mouse for a couple weeks. Or you work in a place where you can't have your sound turn on and you're not allowed to wear headphones. This happens to a lot of people in customer facing roles. Or you're just riding the bus and you have your phone out and you're operating it with one thumb. These are all things that are temporary. You might not think of them as disabilities, but they do affect how people interact with an interface. So, all of these different things, different disabilities that people might have, they use different types of assistive technology in order to adapt. And also, so there are tools and techniques that people use that vary widely based on whatever the condition they're working with is. So for example, speech input. Uh, this is dictation software, but it's not just about dictating text. You can also control your computer by talking to it with something like uh, Dragon. There are a bunch of other alternative input devices like trackballs, switches, head sticks, eye tracking, virtual keyboards, many different ways to get input in. There's magnification. If you have low vision, you might use special magnification software that zooms in and pans across, and sometimes that is combined with a screen reader. Uh, high contrast. Most operating systems come with a built-in high contrast color scheme that you can turn on, makes it easier to see content. 
Uh, combination screen reader highlighters. This is often used by people with certain learning disabilities where the software reads what's on the screen and then also highlights it as it's reading. Uh, keyboard navigation, I put an asterisk on this one because it's not an assistive technology. It's just something you can do. It's a technique. Uh, similarly, custom user style sheets, not usually considered an assistive technology. Uh, browser zoom, just bumping up command plus on your browser. And uh, machine translation, you probably don't think of that as an assistive technology, but is, it is a thing that people do. <coughs> so that's a lot of technology, right? That's a ton of different things. And if you are thinking about learning to use a screen reader, my question is, okay, are you also going to learn all these other things? Because you are going to be busy with that. And if that really interests you, then you might want to consider a career change and become an accessibility tester. And in that case, it would be a great use of your time. So that's the first reason. The second reason that we tell people not to try and learn a screen reader is that, you know, you can learn the tool. You might even become somewhat of an expert at the tool, but learning the tool is not the same as experiencing the barrier. So you will not get the full experience of the problem if you use a tool but you're not someone who relies on it full time. And if you hit a barrier, you can just cheat to get around it. Someone who relies on the technology cannot cheat and they cannot get around it. Um, and I don't want you to outsmart yourself here because we've seen a lot of cases where a developer, you know, learns a screen reader and then they do something wacky to their code because they didn't really understand how people use the technology. Like we had one developer who put a tab index of zero on every element that contained text because they were using a screen reader and hitting the tab key to navigate instead of navigating by heading or by landmark or by link or just starting the top and reading through, which are all ways that someone who actually uses the software full time might do first. And putting a tab index on everything can really mess things up for keyboard users. Also, screen readers differ. A lot of designers and developers use the Mac platform. And if you want to use a screen reader, hey, voiceover is right there. It's built in. Why not learn that and test with that? But the majority of blind people use Windows. <laughs> and on Windows, the screen readers they use would be JAWS or NVDA. And VoiceOver has a completely different paradigm for how it interacts with web content than JAWS or NVDA. So if you're testing with VoiceOver, you're going to miss things that are going to be problems for your Windows users. And even on Windows, JAWS and NVDA differ, so you can have the same markup that's interpreted in two different ways depending on the screen reader. Um, and finally, the impression I get from talking to some developers is that they assume that developing for screen readers is the hardest problem. And if they solve that problem, then you know all the other dominoes are going to fall, and they will have solved accessibility for everyone. But I don't think either of those two things are true. I don't think developing for screen readers is the hardest problem. I think developing for neurodiversity is the hardest problem. And even if you do solve that problem, you're still not going to magically fix everything for everyone else. So, you know, this is kind of a downer, right? Uh, and if you still really, really want to learn to use a screen reader, regardless of everything I've just said, so oh, she told me I couldn't, but I really want to. So I'm going to throw you a bone here, which is go ahead and learn the one that you have in your pocket. If you have a smartphone, then you have a screen reader. Uh, it's built in on iOS and uh, you can get it in the App Store also on Android. And learn that one. You might be able to impress your friends by using your phone with the screen turned completely off. So go ahead and have fun with that one. So that was the philosophical take. And now I want to get into some technical details that might help answer the question. How do you create an accessible interface? So these are all specific markup details and code choices that will affect whether your application is accessible or not. Um, and when we do clinics, we see a lot of problems, as I mentioned, and they tend to come in three general categories. The first one is reinvention. That's taking something that's natively accessible and then re-implementing it in a way that's not accessible which is kind of like if you reinvented the wheel and then automatically, immediately gave it a flat tire. 
right? That is no use to anybody. Please don't do it. And unfortunately, if you're using a front-end framework like React, it's very, very easy to fall into the trap of creating custom widgets that duplicate native functionality and yet are not accessible. The second category is breaking keyboard accessibility. So creating a keyboard trap, which is where a keyboard user gets into something that they cannot get out of. And we have seen some that were so bad that we had to close the browser and actually restart the computer in order to get out of them. Um, that, was, that was a bad day at the clinic. And the third category is what we call ARIA abuse, which is using ARIA in ways that make things worse instead of better. So I'm gonna take a minute to talk about ARIA. ARIA is an acronym. It stands for Accessible Rich Internet Applications, and it is a specification, it's a spec. And what it does is it defines a way for a developer to pass extra information about custom elements to assistive technology using an API. So every operating system has an accessibility API, and ARIA sends information to that API, and then the assistive technology pulls the information out of that API and for custom elements. So when you're thinking about elements, there are three things that are the minimum that every assistive technology needs to know about the element. The first one is name. What is this thing called? How do I address it? How do I tell it apart from other things of the same type? The second thing is role. What kind of thing is it? What can it do? How should I interact with it? And the third thing is state. What's going on with it right now? And if you're using semantic HTML, this stuff is built in. It's native. You don't need to use ARI. So if you consider the example of a checkbox in a form, input type equals checkbox. That automatically, it just has the role checkbox. It has a state, checked or unchecked, which updates as you interact with it. And it has a name, which is applied by the label tag that's associated with that checkbox. So there are also properties and values in, in HTML and ARIA, but name, role, and state are the bare minimum. And you get a lot of stuff just out of HTML, no ARIA required. Another thing it's important to know about ARIA is that it only provides information. It doesn't give you any behaviors or any interactions or any styles. And <coughs> it only provides information to the accessibility API, which means that assistive technologies will read it, but browsers, for example, ignore it. So if you're a keyboard-only user, ARIA is no help to you. <coughs> and as of now, ARIA is reasonably well supported by screen readers, and it's minimally supported by speech input, and it's hardly supported at all by any other kind of assistive technology. So if you think back to that list that I went through of types of disability and assistive technology, there are lots of people for whom ARIA just, it won't make any difference to them. They won't benefit from it. So, um, okay. I'm gonna take a little moment to step back here. I have just said no a lot, and I'm about to say no a lot more. It's gonna be a constant refrain of no, and that's gonna be kind of a drag, right? Because technology is supposed to be all about yes, right? We're empowering people to say yes with technology, and I'm just saying no, 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 no. So I decided I wanted to jazz things up a little bit, and as part of my research, I watched Megan Trainer's music video for her song, No. So I'm gonna lay a few <laughs> no gestures on you uh, that you can deploy as needed. So the first one is your basic stop sign. Arm extended out in front of you, hand uh, facing out, and if you want to add a little flair as you deploy it, <laughs> feel free. Uh, the next one I call the sharp elbows of doom. So you're all crowded here, be careful with this one. Just say no with your elbows, Wah! like so. And uh, the last one is the dismissive hair flip. And I will note that you do not need long hair or even any hair to execute this one, like so. Okay, so. Uh, you're already with your no gestures, and so let's get into what not to code. Uh, I was thinking of calling this section do's and don'ts, and then I realized that most of them are don'ts. <coughs> so anyway, here we go. So we're talking about advanced mistakes here. These are not accessibility 101 mistakes. They're accessibility 201 mistakes. And everything I'm about to say here is something that we have seen in a clinic or on a website that we were just looking at. 
And as a matter of fact, just this week I added three slides of things I'd seen, exciting new mistakes that I want you to all to avoid. And I want to reiterate that you don't have to write anything down or take pictures or whatever. All of this stuff will be posted after the session. And the Web Access team at Berkeley has created a checklist that's free for anyone to grab and use. It's a Google Sheet. It has a bunch of tabs with all of this information on it. So if you feel you must write something down or take a picture, the next slide is what you want to write down. Uh, it is the short URL or you know medium URL <laughs> to our checklist. As I said, it's public. It's freely available. Every detail I'm about to go over is a line on this checklist. So, um, are you all ready for the do's and don'ts, mostly don'ts? Okay. Uh, the first one, it's a good idea to validate your source code. And unless you are creating a fully static site, your source code is generated by something. That might be a Drupal theme or a React front end. But regardless, you need to validate it as it will be experienced by your end users, not just statically. And not every validation error is an accessibility problem, but some are, like if you have duplicate ID attributes, that can be an accessibility problem. The second thing, I call this out of sight, out of mind. Generally, we tell people don't create separate content for screen readers, but sometimes it's kind of necessary. But the problem is it's easy to forget that it exists if you're not seeing it. So if you update your interface, you need to make sure that you've updated your screen reader only content. Also, if your interface updates programmatically, like you're showing and hiding, then your screen reader only text also might have to update programmatically to reflect the actual state of your interface right now. So make sure you keep that in mind. Next, about the A tag. Uh, always use either an href or an ID or both whenever you use the A tag. So an A tag can be a link, in which case it has a destination, which is the href. Or it could be an anchor, in which case it needs an ID so it can be targeted. And if it, the thing you're building is neither a link nor an anchor, don't use the A tag. Use something else. The next thing is tab index. This is about managing the focus order. You should never be using a positive integer value for tab index. Only use 0 or negative 1. Zero is for custom elements that need to be in the keyboard order so that people can get to it and interact with it. Negative one is for something that needs to be focusable programmatically, but it shouldn't be in the tab order. So you shouldn't be adding that to links or buttons, but you might add it to a container that is the target of a skip link, for example. Uh, and now I'm going to go a little more detail about ARIA. And I want to do a little call and response here. So. If anyone knows what the first rule of ARIA is, I'm going to say, the first rule of ARIA is, don't, don't use ARIA. <laughs> OK, so that is not just me being snarky. That is actually in the spec. If you go to the W3C page and you find they're using ARIA documentation, that is the first rule. So what does that actually mean? It means always use native elements. Don't use ARIA when there's a native element that has the semantics you need. And you certainly don't want to use an ARIA role that contradicts the native semantics of the element. And so, okay, here comes an opinion. Like, here's my little snowflake here. I feel very strongly about this. You should basically never be using role equals button. If you want to say span role equals button, then <coughs> use the button tag. You wouldn't say button role equals button because that's redundant. And if you say A role equals button, or even worse, H2 role equals button, you're contradicting native semantics and you will mess things up for somebody, I guarantee it. So uh, I want to now give you a list of things to be cautious about. There are some ARIA roles and properties that are useful and have definite uh, use cases, but they're easy to mess up, so you need to be careful with them and, and use them as designed. The first problem people has, have with this is misplaced properties. So not all ARIA properties apply to all element types. For example, the ARIA label. Some assistive technologies will ignore it if it's not applied to something that is interactive or a landmark or a widget role. So it's no use. And likewise for something like ARIA expanded, 
there are elements that it is defined to apply to and elements that it doesn't apply to. So if you add these things to a span or a div, they will probably be ignored. Or if you apply them to any elements where the assistive technology isn't expecting them to be there, they'll be ignored. Um, role equals presentation and role equals none. These are things that remove the native semantics from an element, but that only happens if you're using an assistive technology that understands ARIA. And they can have unintended effects on child elements and nested content, and they can definitely break accessibility, particularly if you put them on something on a tag that's natively focusable. Then we have ARIA hidden equals true. This attribute hides content from assistive technology. It makes the technology ignore it. It can also have unexpected effects on nested content, and it's especially confusing if you're using its assistive technology that understands ARIA, but you can also see the screen. So you can see the thing, but your technology is telling you the thing isn't there, and it's not letting you interact with it. It can be very confusing. Um, tab, the tab design pattern. So we've been doing clinics for 13 years, and in all that time, we have seen one implementation that actually worked correctly for everyone. So it's fussy, it's easy to do wrong, and if you want to use this design pattern, then start with the ARIA spec. They have a reference implementation, grab that and go from there. Uh, role equals alert, role equals dialogue, and ARIA live. These are all things that can interrupt the assistive technology, or pull focus away, or speak constantly and override what people are trying to do, so use them sparingly and carefully. And finally, ARIA label. Now this gets an honorable mention in this section because you'd think it would always be useful, right? How could it not be? You're labeling something with text. But if the ARIA label is not visible on the screen, or if it conflicts with something that's on the screen, you can really mess things up for speech input users or anyone who is both seeing and hearing the screen. Um, so that was the cautions. Now I want to get into the uh, warning, hazardous, danger, please no. And the things I'm about to talk about almost always cause more problems than they solve. So in my opinion, again, opinion, you should not be using these roles in your interfaces. The first ones are menu, menu bar, menu item, and also toolbar. Uh, it's not for site navigation. That's what nav is for. And I know that we colloquially call site navigation a menu when we're just chatting about interfaces, but that doesn't mean it's an ARIA menu. If what you have is a list of destinations, that's navigation. If you have a list of actions, like an application menu where you have your file and your edit and your updates and preferences, that might be an ARIA menu. So similarly with toolbar, it's not about destinations, it's about actions. And next, uh, role equals application. I don't think you should ever use this because when you do, uh, all of the like 4,000 keystrokes that an assistive technology user can use to control their computer, pff, they're gone. You've made them go away. Role equals application makes the assistive technology ignore the keystrokes and pass them on to the browser. That is almost always a terrible thing to do to somebody. So you might think that you're building a web application, but I'm gonna push back on that and say, you call it a web application, I call it a collection of widgets with some text interspersed that has to be read and understood. So use the other ARIA roles for those things as, the, as needed. And again, 13 years of clinics, I've seen one thing that was a legitimate use of role application and that was a fully featured Python IDE that was written in the browser and intended to function like a native application. So if you are building a Python IDE, go ahead, knock yourself out, use roll off application. But when you do so, you have to know that because you have taken away all of the ways that assistive technology users can effectively interact with your stuff, you better provide that for them in some other way. Um, so, uh, I just finished telling you a bunch of stuff to just rip out of your code. Just go right out of here and rip it out, or don't put it in the first place. And before that, I told you, 
don't use a screen reader to test or don't try to learn one. So to answer the part of the question about how do you know if you've succeeded, uh, you do need to do some testing. So how should you be doing that? Um, and if you don't have a disability that affects how you interact with these interfaces and you don't rely on assistive technology, then the best thing you can do is to test with the keyboard only. And the reason is it's a great proxy for all different kinds of things. For example, you might not think that keyboard testing would have anything to do with speech input, but if you're using Dragon, you can speak commands such as press tab or press alt F4 or press command right arrow, and it emulates the keyboard, and it's a great way for power users to really speed up what they're doing by speaking these complicated keyboard commands and the assistive technology that emulates the keyboard. So keyboard testing covers a lot of different things. And when you're going to start t keyboard testing, the first thing you need to do is unplug everything. So unplug your mouse, unplug your trackball, cover up the touchpad, ignore that little eraser thingy in the keyboard if you have one. You really need to be interacting just with physical keys. Tab, space, enter, arrows, home, end, modifiers, that kind of thing. And there are some specific things to look for. And again, everything I'm about to mention is A, something we've seen problems with in a clinic, and B, on that checklist that you can grab uh, and use however you want. So, um, skipping repeated content, this is pretty basic. You can use a skip link for this. Simple, easy to implement. Fully operable, that means that every interaction on the page has to be usable somehow with the keyboard. So expand collapse, uh, tree view slider, modal, lightbox overlay, dialogue, even drag and drop. All of those things should have some way to use them with the keyboard. <coughs> Tab in both directions. This is one of the new slides. <clears throat> We've seen some applications. <clears throat> Excuse me, I've got to hydrate here for a second. We've seen some applications where tabbing forward through the page worked fine but it was impossible to tab backward. You would get stuck because of the way the JavaScript was capturing the keystrokes. It was capturing tab, but not shift tab, and you would get stuck in a keyboard trap and, you know, close the browser, shut down the computer, start again. <laughs> so make sure that you can tab all the way forward and backward through your interface, full, whole thing, both directions. Uh, dismissing modals. If you are using any pop-ups or overlays or modals or light boxes, you have to be able to dismiss them with just the keyboard, and if you can't, that's basically a keyboard trap right there. Uh, focus constrained. When you have a modal or a light box, your keyboard focus should be constrained within it. Otherwise, you could tab off it, and then suddenly you're behind the modal, and you can't see what you're doing, and you might also get stuck in a keyboard trap there. And um, you, uh, let's see. Oh yes, focus visible, that was my segue. Browsers have built-in focus highlighting, but it can be inadequate. And so you should create your own focus styles that work with the foreground and background colors that you're using in your design. Um, and you can test them across browsers, and you'll be sure that they're working without having to rely on which browser somebody's using. And also, this is a good place to be sure that you're not hiding content visibly, but leaving it in the tab order because that is really confusing and adds a lot of drama if you're navigating with the keyboard. Um, equivalent to hover effects, so plug your mouse back in for a second and then hover over all parts of the interface and make sure that if you have a hover effect that there is some kind of equivalent keyboard focus effect. Uh, responsive breakpoints, so after you've done all that list of things Increase the zoom in your browser, so command plus or whatever, until you hit a responsive breakpoint and do it again. Because anyone who's using magnification or browser zoom is going to be interacting with what you think of as your tablet or your phone version, but they will be probably doing it on a device with a physical keyboard. So uh, mobile breakpoints are not just for touchscreen users. You have to anticipate that they will be used with a keyboard. So. Um, there are some things that can help you with all this, some tools. Uh, automated tools, there are a bunch of them. There are scanning services, uh, there are browser extensions, there are command line tools. 
So for example, if you're on Drupal 8 and you're using Nightwatch or whatever, you can download uh, the Axe.js library and plug it into your Nightwatch and have it run in your JavaScript test suite. Now these tools will not find everything, and you know, not even close to everything, but they are a great way to process a lot of code very quickly, and they can identify a lot of glaring and probably easy to fix issues. And the last thing that we always recommend is that it's a great idea to test your interface with real people. And this is basically what we do in a clinic. And it's led to a lot of, you know, moments where a developer or a designer sees how somebody might be using their interface with an assistive technology and they get it. And they understand how it's different and what they might have to do in order to make it accessible. And ideally, if you're doing this, the, the expert should be someone who is both a native user of some assistive te technology and someone who has accessibility expertise overall. So, um, do we all think we're done here, right? <laughs> Follow the checklist and we're all good. We'll all be able to create accessible interfaces and we'll know we've succeeded. Well, unfortunately, I can't give you a 100% resounding yes on that because Excel accessibility isn't so much a place that you can get to and be done, it's a moving target. Because technologies change, design and code trends change, laws and standards change, best practices change, and even all that stuff I just told you not to do, at some point that might change. And the web access team will be keeping our checklist updated as new developments occur, but the ultimate test and the ultimate answer to the question is, it's accessible if people can use it. That's the ultimate definition of accessibility. So what's really going to keep on being important, regardless of technology change, is the philosophical approach, the holistic view of accessibility as more than just one disability, just one approach, just one assistive technology. So if you all keep that in mind, that I'm pretty confident <laughs> that everyone in here can go forth and can create accessible interfaces. And uh, that's all I have right now. Uh, I would like to open it up to questions. And I'm going to repeat the questions just in case the uh, recording can't pick them up. Yes? Hi. Uh, thanks for your presentation. Really informative. Um, I have two questions. One, the clinics you mentioned, is that something you, is that just for Berkeley? systems or couldn't I come along and bring my project? Right. And two, um, could you, and I don't know if this is correct, if you don't want to answer this one, it's fine, but could you help me think through how a button and a link really are, like, because sometimes we visually, it's a, it's a link, but mm -hmm. it looks like a button, right? right. It visually it looks like a button you might find on the floor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, like from a screen, screen reader's perspective, is, is that, is, do I have to do anything there? Or is it just a, is it a link? Sure. Sure. So the first question is, uh, these clinics I talk about, can I come and bring my thing or are they just for Berkeley? So the clinics themselves are, are open, but if you want to bring something in and have it evaluated, then that's for Berkeley affiliates, um, uh, third-party vendors for whom Berkeley is buying their product, or anything that's uh, system-wide, like Office of the President, if it affects Berkeley. And on our web access site, there's a calendar. Anna, do you want to pipe up about Just that? Just to add to that, too, um, if you are looking for folks to help test your website because you are not a Berkeley department or affiliate or whatever, uh, on our Test with Real People page in the DIY Accessibility Checklist section of the website that Caroline mentioned, there's a list of resources of other people who might be Okay, so I'm going to just repeat that for the recording. Uh, Anna mentioned that uh, if you're not a Berkeley affiliate, that on our Web Access website, uh, there are lists of resources for testing with real people, and they're also included in the checklist. So your second question was uh, about links versus buttons. Sometimes it's a link, but it looks like a button. How does a screen reader understand it? Is that? Yeah. Okay. Well, I understand. Yeah. Right, right. So uh, generally speaking, when you think about a link and a button, a link is meant for going someplace, and a button is meant for doing something. And um, the keyboard interactions with them are slightly different. I always get this mixed up. I forget which is which. But okay, so a button, you can activate with the Enter key, 
but you can also activate with a space bar. A link, if you're focused on it, you can, you can activate with the enter key, but not with a space bar. So if you hit space bar on a link that looks like a button, what's probably going to happen is your viewport is going to move, because that's what the space bar does in most browsers. So that is one reason that if it's a button, it should look like a button and act like a button. It's the duck test, basically. It, if it looks like a duck, it should quack like a duck, or however you want to, <laughs> however you want to say that. Does that answer your question? Yeah. OK. Uh, other questions? Yes, all the way in the back. Um, do you have uh, a suggested resource for code examples? There's a lot of don't do this. Yeah, yeah. So the question is, do you have resources for code examples? Because I just said no, and I didn't say a lot of yes. Um, so if you're thinking about ARIA, then the ARIA, the W3C ARIA website has a bunch of design patterns. And I think they include uh, not only the markup, but also some of the JavaScript. They have examples of uh, HTML, ARIA, JavaScript, CSS for some of these design patterns. Also, um, what is it, uh, Whatsock, W-H-A-T-S-O-C-K. Uh, a blind developer has created a whole bunch of resources uh, and uh, examples of accessible patterns, including things like drag and drop, which is kind of kind of difficult. <coughs> Anyone else? Yes, another one. So I hate both of them, but we can't seem to shift some of them in our organization. When you say that a mode has to be exited by keyboard uh, action, how would, how would somebody know which action to take? Is it just escape? Is that the natural right. way? So the question is about modals. Um, when I say that it has to be dismissible with the keyboard, is uh, how do people know how to dismiss it with the keyboard? Most people will try escape, so you should definitely plan for that. And also, a lot of modals have a close uh, button that is in the keyboard focus and is one of the things that you tab through as you're constrained on the modal. Yes, another what question. What sock? What sock? Yes, the W H A T S O C K dot com. Uh, it's the site uh, developed by uh, Brian Garaventa, who's, as I said, a, a blind developer, and he has created uh, JavaScript libraries and examples of accessible implementations of a bunch of this stuff. And there are plenty of other resources out there, but that's just the one that is on the top of my head at the moment. Anybody else? Okay, well, thank you so much for coming. Uh, I really appreciate you all being here. And also, as I mentioned, uh, before, maybe before some of you came in, there's another presentation tomorrow uh, about how to choose which testing tools are right for you based on your budget and your needs. So um, if you're interested in that, uh, you might want to check that presentation out. Thank you. Are you doing that one? No, I am not. That's Amy from Hook 42. As a matter of fact, I have one of those